Christians must argue that their Bible is the ultimate source of moral and ethical teachings, as well as the perfect and infallible message from Yahweh, and the perfect account of human creation and history leading up to our supposed Savior. If it is morally, historically, or scientifically flawed in any way, then it is not perfect, and at which point must be accepted as another mythical book. If the Christian Bible is definitively immoral, it is not our source for ethics and moral principles. And if this is the case, then the Bible is pointless as its primary goal is to set a foundation of righteousness. First, let's consider all of the other religions, or at least briefly look over some of the prominent ones. Let's assume for now that our morality, the fundamental human ethics, do in fact come from a god, a god of one of our world religions. Christians argue that their Bible and Yahweh are the basis of our moral compass, so if the assertion is to be made that human morality is an indicator of the truth of Christianity and validity of the Bible, the Bible therefore must align with our innate ethics as well as be morally superior to all other religions. If we find that other religions are moral despite having different holy books and other gods, then it is conclusively indisputable that morality does not derive from the Israelites tribal war god, or the Christian Bible, and in fact can be either engineered by humans in complete isolation from Judaism or Christianity, or it is simply innate. If a primary function of religion is to establish morals, and we discover that the other religions are morally superior to Christianity and the Christian Bible, as well as its god, then this is a significantly relevant indicator that Christianity is quite likely not to be the correct religion, assuming for a moment that there is one. First, let's look at Hinduism. It's the oldest religion still in practice today. Hindus live by the Vedas, which are a compilation of wisdom and mystical incantations and anecdotes of the Hindu gods and their creation. Written between the 17th and 11th century BCE, they also contain the ten yamas, which cover their entire moral guidelines. They are as follows. Non-injury, truthfulness, non-stealing, sexual purity, patience, steadfastness, compassion, honesty, moderate diet, and purity. We also have Taoism. Taoists live by the Tao Te Ching, which has a collection of of ancient wisdom written in the 4th century BCE. They teach about the Tao, a universal energy of peace and harmony, and how one can live a selfless and peaceful life with non-confrontation and non-evil. Here are some excerpts from the Tao Te Ching. The truth is not always beautiful, nor beautiful words the truth. All streams flow to the sea because it is lower than they are. Humility gives it its power. If you want to govern people, you must learn to place yourself below them. If you want to lead the people, you must learn how to follow them. There's also Jainism. Jains follow the holy text known as the Agam literature, or the Sutras, written in 3000 BCE. It's a collection of Lord Mahavir's sermons. It strongly teaches universal love and mercy to all living creatures. They follow five strict moral principles known as the Panchavrathas, which are non-violence, truth, non-stealing, chastity, and non-possession. Then we have one of the most peaceful religions out there, Buddhism. Buddhists follow the teachings of the Buddha, who lived between 563 and 483 BCE. He taught peace, love, and non-violence. The primary code of ethics is the Eightfold path and the Four Noble Truths. The Eightfold Path is as follows. Know the truth. Free your mind of evil. Say nothing that hurts others. Work for the good of others. Respect life. Resist evil. Practice meditation. And control your thoughts. The Four Noble Truths are Life has suffering. Suffering is caused by greed and materialism. Suffering will end when people overcome greed, and greed can be overcome in the Eightfold Path. Buddha also had many wise teachings, such as Silence the angry man with love. Silence the ill-natured man with kindness, silence the miser with generosity, and silence the liar with truth. These religions are exponentially more straightforward with their moral teachings than Christianity, and I could have mentioned many more such as Zoroastrianism and Confucianism, but I believe my point was made. Very little of the Christian Bible even contains moral or ethical teachings, and most of them are highly problematic at best. Aside from being morally superior, all the above mentioned religions long predate the Bible or Christianity, so it is physically impossible for any of them to have borrowed from Jesus' teachings or any of the biblical ethics. So now, let's look at the Bible. While while we may be able to point out imperfections in the previously mentioned religions, you will never justify child abuse with the Tao Te Ching. You will never find Buddha's teachings to condone genocide. You will never find intolerance taught in Jainism. And despite many problems with Hinduism and the Vedas, they do not teach that anyone will be thrown into a torture chamber for all of eternity. But what about Yahweh and the Christian Bible? Christians tend to brush off the Old Testament saying that it isn't relevant because we are no longer under that covenant. However, if you claim that Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then unless you believe he has changed, the Old Testament is, is still an example of his ethics, even if they aren't enforced. And if our morals come from him, and he is perfect, then so too should the Old Commandments. But if they were unjust, then Yahweh is not a just God. And if his actions and laws were wicked, then they aren't the basis of our morality. And then the Bible is both evil and untrue.
Forgiveness, justice, and fairness are at the very heart of morality. We should forgive people's mistakes, and when necessary, punishment should not outweigh the crime. But what was Yahweh's justice like? The Bible says he was a just God, a good judge, but let's be the judge of that. Yahweh was a major advocate for capital punishment, which isn't inherently wrong. It's a fitting crime for murderers or rapists. But for what crimes did Yahweh sentence people to death? Let's take a look. People who question authority. Witches, homosexuals, fortune tellers, difficult children, adulterers, girls who have sex before marriage, girls who don't bleed on their wedding night, people of other religions, atheists, false prophets, an entire town if one person worships another god, blasphemers, anyone who walked up to the tabernacle, anyone who worked on the Sabbath, and of course women who grabbed the genitals of a man during a fight to rescue her husband. That one's important. There is much more capital punishment in the Old Testament, but what about the other laws? What were Yahweh's laws concerning slavery? Slavery is never condemned in the Bible, but Yahweh apparently had very detailed laws on how to acquire slaves and how to treat them depending on their gender or race. Exodus 21 explains that if you buy a male Hebrew slave, he will serve you for only six years, and once his time is up, he will be free. However, if his master gives him a wife, then after the six years, she will belong to the master. And if she has children with the slave husband, then the children will also belong to the master. But if the slave wants to stay with his wife and family, then he can pledge himself as property to his master for life, at which point he will be branded. And if a Hebrew man sells his daughter as a female slave, then she is not to go free after six years as the males do, but instead is permanent property of her master. But if her master isn't pleased with her services, then he can return her to her father and collect his money back. He gets a full refund. Or he has the choice to give her to his son, whatever he decides. Leviticus 25 says that the Israelites are not to be sold to outsiders in slavery cells. And if you do buy a fellow Israelite as a slave, you are to treat them as a servant and not as property. However, you may purchase or kidnap slaves from pagan nations, and they are your permanent property to do as you wish with. And if they have children, they will also be your property. You may also pass down your slaves as inheritance to your son. So, how harsh did Yahweh permit that you could beat your slaves? Exodus 21 says that if you hit your slave so hard that they die immediately, then you will be punished in some way. If, however, the slave doesn't die from the abuse immediately, but survives a day or two and then dies, perhaps from internal bleeding or brain damage or something of that source, then the master will not receive any punishments because it was, in fact, his own property. Slavery is explicitly condoned by Yahweh in the Bible, and these passages have been used to justify slavery throughout the world ever since. The Bible was effectively used to justify African enslavement in the United States. If humans never questioned these teachings, we would still have slaves in America today. If you agree, as does all of the civilized world, that slavery is wrong, then the Bible is not your foundation of morals. So how did Yahweh protect rape victims? If a woman is already engaged to another man and is raped, then the rapist will be killed. That's fair enough. But if a woman is not engaged to any man and someone rapes her, then the rapist shall give his victim's father. 50 shekels, and the victim shall become his wife, and she cannot divorce her rapist for all of her days. If you can't see the injustice here, then there is something terribly wrong with you. I can't think of anything more horrific or disgusting than a rape victim being forced to marry her rapist. Can you imagine the trauma these innocent, helpless Israelite women had to experience every day and every night? After being defiled in the worst way possible, they receive absolutely no justice, but instead are bargained away to their violator as nothing more than broken property. And are then sentenced to a life of sleeping with a privileged monster. And Christians believe that the God who created this law is responsible for our morality and the basis of our goodness. The rape laws, aside from simply being morally reprehensible, are completely sexist as well, taking all rights and justice and freedom away from the woman. The rapist isn't even punished for violating another human, but instead is only punished for breaking the property of another man. Obviously, the Bible is very male-centered, with 1,181 male characters being named and only 188 females. From the beginning, the woman belongs to the man and is punished more severely. And even on to the New Testament, women aren't allowed to teach and are told to cover their heads in shame when they pray, and order to remain silent in the church. They're also told that if they desire to learn anything, they can't study on their own, but instead have to ask their husband about it in the privacy of their home. The double standards that the Christian Bible instructs between men and women is disgusting. Women and underage girls had no choice in who they married, or whether they even wanted to or not. They were sold as property to any man who wanted them, or given away as gifts, or sold at a discount to any man that raped them before they became engaged. Not only is this unfair, but it is also rape. 
rape. If she doesn't consent, it doesn't matter if you're legally her husband or not, it's still a personal violation. Another double standard is the fact that girls were executed for having sex before marriage, but never the men. The Bible was obviously written by men who had a fetish for female virginity. Also, polygamy is rampant throughout the Bible, and never once is it condemned. A man could have as many wives as he liked. Women were also considered a nuisance, in order to remain silent, and thought to be filthy and disgusting. In the Bible, they are property. Not hardly humans, they were the booty of war. The Bible paints women as blatantly inferior to men. These are just a sample of the barbaric laws enforced by Yahweh in the Christian Bible. Aside from that, Yahweh directly killed people for unjust reasons. He drowned millions or possibly billions of people in the flood. He murdered 42 small boys for laughing at an old bald man. He killed 50,070 men because some of them were curious and looked into the Ark of the Covenant. He killed a man with a lion because the guy refused to hit a prophet. He got angry and murdered the guy who saved the Ark of the Covenant from smashing to the ground, and he also killed all of the firstborn sons of Egypt. He also threatened to not only kill people, but their animals and children, as well as their unborn children, and not only kill them, but to make them suffer horrible things. If people refused to obey him, he would multiply their afflictions in life. He would send wild animals to eat their children and kill their cattle. He became angry with Israel and threatened to slaughter all of their children, including those who were not yet born. If Israel disobeyed him, he threatened to curse them with diseases until they perished, and blindness and confusion and boils so that they couldn't work in the field for food, and he would curse their unborn babies, and send a nation to overtake them and force them into poverty and hunger until they began eating their own children. Yahweh obviously had a craving for bloodshed. On top of everything else, he commanded mass genocide on many, many, many occasions, ordering Israel to slaughter the men, women, and children. But as for the virgin women, the soldiers could keep them alive for themselves to do whatever they wanted with. And in case any of the Israelites didn't fancy all of the innocent bloodshed, Yahweh said, cursed be those who do not kill. But what about abortion? If you're against it, that's unfortunate as a Christian. There's plenty of it commanded and threatened by Yahweh in the Bible. In Numbers 5, Yahweh told Moses that if a woman became pregnant and her husband is suspicious that she has cheated on him but has no evidence, he should bring her to the priest with a bread offering of iniquity. The priest will then take some of the woman's hair and place it on the bread for some reason, and then with dirt and water the priest will prepare a bitter drink and have the woman swear an oath. The priest will then give the woman the drink, and if she has cheated on the man, then her unborn child will rot away. But if she hasn't, then she will deliver the child. This is abortion, commanded by Yahweh through some weird voodoo ritual. Yahweh also enjoyed slaughtering born and unborn babies. He also commanded Israelites to kill everyone, including the babies and all the pregnant women as well. Not only did Yahweh have many babies killed, but he also commanded all of the male children to have their genitals hacked off with sharp rocks and knives, probably one of the most disgusting laws in the Bible. Arguably worse than the wicked laws in the Bible is the fact that it neglects to condemn some of the worst actions a human could commit. If it's the standard of human ethics and morality, why does it forget to mention some of the worst sins, like animal abuse or pedophilia? Nowhere in the Bible is it ever condemned. Yahweh was thorough with his laws, specifying how harshly you could beat your slaves, and how to and to not cut your hair, and letting humanity know the clothing choices he approved of. But he never even addressed pedophilia. The Bible is specific about the size of penises and the amount that they dispersed, but he doesn't even attempt to explain how the act of having sex with children is wrong. While age is never mentioned, the virgin girls of nations the Israelites invaded were kidnapped and raped. The girls would have been of all ages. Girls were also sold to any man that might want a wife or additional wife. And again, there's no required age of availability. The list could be extensively longer if we spent more time delving into each specific subject. These immoral and unjust actions, orders, and laws are all either commanded, condoned, or directly executed by Yahweh. You will not find Vishnu responsible for any such atrocities in the Vedas, nor will you find the Buddha, the Tao, Confucius, Tahotep, or Lord Mahavir condoning such malevolent deeds. And if they did, Christians would undoubtedly be condemning them as wicked, just as they do the Muslims. But if you're a Christian, there is nothing you can condemn about Muslims other than that they worship the wrong god. If they were doing exactly what they were doing under the divine command of Yahweh, then their suicide bombings and acts of terrorism would be righteous in your eyes. This is yet another example of the hypocrisy of Christians, the blatant double standards. When their invisible friend orders children to be slaughtered and women to be kidnapped and raped, they are quick to proclaim, Yahweh works in mysterious ways. His ways are higher than ours. Many Christians, despite
dismiss the obscene laws of the Old Testament simply by claiming it was Yahweh setting an example. This is an easy cop-out for an apathetic psychopath or embarrassingly naive individual. How narcissistic does one have to be to see the lives of people 1,000 or 5,000 years ago to be of less value than the ones today? If you can find it in yourself to personally justify rape, murder, slavery, genocide, throwing out any sense of morality in the name of an invisible deity through the power of faith, if you can so easily dismiss critical thinking and proceed to justify and rationalize rape, polygamy, slavery, genocide, sexism, and the mutilation of infants' genitalia, human trafficking, and so many more atrocities, then you are a sick human and far beyond any sensible conversation or logical discussion. I am disgusted when I hear otherwise intelligent Christians boldly justifying the stoning of adolescents in the Old Testament without hesitation. It was part of God's perfect plan. It was an example for us. What omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent deity must resort to having innocent men, women, children, and even the unborn executed in the most brutal ways possible? As an example of what is moral and immoral, especially when many of the crimes had nothing to do with wickedness, a human should never stoop so low to establish laws, much less an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God.